I lived in France for six months. One of my favorite things to do is walk around just to clear my head and see what the local area is like. And so whenever I'm in a new place, I walk around as much as possible. Often miles in each direction is a way to figure out what the culture and vibe of that place is. Once you see the architecture, trees, landscape, ethnicity, clothes, and body language that the people have, you can generally understand how that place works. The city I was in, Montpellier, had a medieval 18th century and 19th century core city area. You could photograph it and use it as a symbol for all of Western civilization. There's a cathedral, a Rococo city center, some Roman architecture, and lots of buildings that look like they're from the era of Les Miserables. However, once you walk out from the city center to the areas further out in the suburbs, the architecture changes very quickly. It all looks like this, with square buildings made out of glass and steel. This is the normal state of European cities, with a medieval and early modern downtown which bleeds into modernist post-World War II suburbs. An architectural change of this rapid a speed is something you normally see with the rise of a new civilization. In a place like Egypt, you can very easily determine if a building was built by the ancient Egyptians, Persians, British, Muslims, or Greeks. Each civilization had their own very profound architectural style, which can't be mistaken for any other. An archaeologist can look at this and see the eras of a certain architecture's construction, and come to the conclusion that there was a period in which a completely different civilization took over the area. Archaeologists thousands of years from now, who somehow lost all records of our time, would be completely justified in guessing that there was some global spanning empire that developed after the world's wars, which had a completely different culture, and conquered all over the planet except a few locations, imposing its new style. This view is, ironically, very true and untrue at the exact same time, as we'll see in this video. The art and architecture of a society demonstrates the values and worldview of that civilization. We do this every day without realizing it, by looking at the way someone dresses, the music they listen to, or the art they keep in their home, as a demonstration for how their mind works. This is the bedrock of Spengler's entire theory of the world. The thing is that what happened here in France is something that occurred all over the rest of the world. You could go to California, China, Japan, Moscow, Sao Paulo, South Africa, or Tunisia to see buildings that look exactly the same. This was a change that occurred all around the world at the same time. The very strange thing is that this is something we don't really ever talk about as a society and has never been thought about in a serious way. Most histories treat the world wars as a horrible breaking point in history, after which the world learned its lessons. We then embarked upon a new age of tolerance, rationality, science, and peace. No one has looked into the real trade-offs of what this change to modernity has entailed. The thing with culture is you know it's real when people don't even think about it. Individualism is so ingrained in Western culture that, let's say most Americans don't think about it until they meet someone who comes from Zimbabwe or China or go to those countries. We're so deeply ingrained in the myth of modernity that we ignore it. What I think is the most profound shift ever in history occurred around the world wars and since the Industrial Revolution. As you'll see, the more you investigate, the system will literally persecute you. As Voltaire said, you can tell who's in power by who you're not allowed to criticize. We're just getting started here, and I'm really excited to make this video and to see what the reaction is. Wait until the end. I promise you that this video will blow your mind and you won't see where it's going. Buckle up. I sometimes lay asleep at night thinking about everything going on in the world with my mind racing and I need something to help me relax and take my mind off everything going on. Thankfully, Galaxy Lamps is perfect for just that. Galaxy Lamps transforms any room into a planetarium and it gives a truly unique look and feel. But not only that, with RGB colors, brightness, rotation speed, on, off timers, and many more fully customizable options. Grab your phone with its app, you can change everything and make it truly yours. Love using Alexa or Google Assistant? Well, it's also a smart device. Just say the word and it obeys from switching on to changing modes. 
Complete hands-free magic. And guess what? It's energy efficient too. Enjoy your personal galaxy without worrying about your electricity bill skyrocketing. For those who appreciate good tech, this is for you as well. The Galaxy Projector is a modern gadget with timeless appeal. Get your projector by clicking the link below. Use the code WHATIF to get 15% off. The worst, most cliché way to start an essay is to define a word. However, that won't stop me from doing it here. The history of the word modern itself is fascinating and a great place to start to explain what modernity is and is not. The word modern stems from the Middle Ages. This will probably surprise people, but the West has been calling itself modern for the last thousand years. The term originally meant to signify a distinction between the world before and after the rise of the church to power. According to Christendom, the rise of Christianity was was so profound as to split history in half, with a period before, which they called antiquity, and modernity, or after we learned the good news of the gospel. Ever since the beginning, modernity is meant to signify an intellectual breakthrough of such profound levels as to change the world entirely. To someone in 1200, they were modern, while they would read Julius Caesar or Plato, who were the classics of antiquity. A great irony is that this term came to mean the exact opposite of its its original meaning. In the Renaissance, in which Italian humanist thinkers started to unearth the classics from Greece and Rome, they started to think that they had much more in common with the secular humanist worldview the ancients had than their medieval Catholic ancestors. This created the tripartite division of history that we still have today, of ancient, medieval, and modern. Modernity at this point means the realization of humanism, or the strength of humanity, as opposed to the religious Middle Ages. For the entire period from 1400 to 1960, this was the meaning of the word modern. The modern age in a history book will start normally with Columbus, and then continue on to today, thus being the last 500 years. The original medieval meaning of modernity was that as the church attained these great truths, they would use them to improve humanity until the end of days when Christ would set things right. This is the invention of the concept of progress, which didn't exist in any other society. Over the Renaissance and scientific age, this concept of progress was changed to the creation of a human utopia. This would be a place of peace, wealth, love, and advancement. Basically, the same goal as the Christian kingdom of heaven, but instead achieved through human effort. This is called the technological project and is the raison d'etre of all ideologies today. I talk about this more in my video on the secret history of the 20th century, but for fascism, liberalism, and communism, they all believe that we should use technology and social engineering to reach an earthly utopia. People might not be overt about this today, but the underlying promise behind any idea of ending racism or poverty is towards building a perfect society. This would be alien to almost anyone else in history, who just saw it as their responsibility to stave off social collapse and barbarism. They believe that the only way to achieve happiness and peace was through religion and not of this world, because this world would always be warlike and chaotic, which has been the historic record. Something very interesting happened at this point. Since the 1960s, we've started using the phrase postmodern. Postmodernism is the underlying driving philosophy of our entire culture today. What this means is that the West for a thousand years believed that they had reached a point of profound new truth about how the world worked. However, the world wars broke this understanding so that people felt that they had no idea what was next. This is an incredibly profound shift, and by the end of the video, you'll realize why it happened. The spur for me to write this video was moving from where I grew up in rural Pennsylvania to Los Angeles, where I stayed for a few months before going to where I live now in Texas. Where I grew up was mostly white, most people I knew went to church, the architecture is European, the countryside looks European, people speak a European language, the climate is temperate, the same as Europe, and it uses an English political philosophy while people dress in clothes invented in Europe. The culture here is a very clear extension of European civilization, or that being the West. I'm trying to say this without any value judgment attached to it, which our culture naturally piles onto anything relating to anthropology, but rather as a statement of anthropological fact that there are certain parts of America that are very cleanly an extension of a European civilization. 
I've done a lot of civilization videos, and I've studied a lot of different societies, and I was comparing the foundations of Western civilization with what I saw in California. The architecture in Southern California was nothing like what Europe says. The socio-political code there was constructed in the last century by people who weren't really influenced by Locke, Aquinas, or Greek mythology, and it's clearly a post-Christian society. Los Angeles is ethnically minority white European. It doesn't revere the heroes or stories stories of what you have from earlier Western civilization. Besides the English language and an American legal code, both of which California is trying to do away with for better or for worse, California lacks almost any of the defining features that would show it to be the same civilization as that which came out of Western Europe with the fall of Rome. California was clearly something different from Europe or Pennsylvania, but I had also lived in Mexico and Peru, so I could tell it wasn't Latin America either, or frankly any other civilization in the world. World. This was clearly something new. My definition for modern civilization is that it built its identity around not being a previous civilization. For example, Maoist China built itself in opposition to the previous Chinese civilization, as did all communists, which I cover in the communist civilization video. Modern Western progressives, like in California, build their identity in direct opposition to the previous Western civilization. You also see this a lot in the Third World, where Middle Eastern dictatorship like the Shah of Iran or Saddam Hussein try to be secular or opposed to traditional Islamic values. In lots of African dictatorships like Angola as pictured, you'll see expensive immaculate capitals surrounded by countryside stuck in the Iron Age. If you listen to a government speeches and they talk a lot about progress, modernization, secularism, and equality, you're looking at modern civilization. This is my best attempt to map modern civilization. It's basically impossible to map for reasons that'll become more and more obvious. The best way to try to do this is to show two maps, one from 1970 and another from today. On a purely geographic basis, 1970 was the era when the most of the planet was covered by modernist states. In the Western Bloc, you had the European Union and the American government ruling under the idea of social engineering to reach progress. The Communist Bloc is the region most obviously in this category. Then most of the Third World was under the rule of technocratic dictators who tried stuff like Third World Socialism or secular liberal technocracy in order to catch up with the developed nations. All of the areas under modernist ideologies we can call technocracies. What we've actually seen, which might surprise a lot of people, is a retreat of modernity over the last 50 years. Red State America rebelled under the Reagan Revolution, creating a society that's very vocally Christian and Western as a opposed to the more technocratic progressive Republicans of earlier decades like Eisenhower. Islam flipped from modern secular to Muslim governance, and a lot of the third world gave up as well, being more willing to accept and take pride in their local cultures rather than be modern. Russia also gave up on modernity with turning more conservative and explicitly orthodox rather than communist, while China moved from communism to pulling on nationalism and Confucianism. This is my map of what modernity is today. I think there are two obvious outtakes from this. The first is, as said before, modernity has been fighting a defensive battle against traditional civilizations for the last 50 years, and has been growing weaker. Secondly, that it's clear modernity is imposed from above, and that it's completely normal for a capital city or elites to be modernist, while the countryside is still the traditional civilization of whatever that area is. Modern civilization is a global technocracy of the elites who often have more in common with each other than with their own countrymen. I've traveled and been to a lot of places. When I've been to New York or LA for a few months, it's very clear that they feel more comfortable talking to someone from those cities, or London, an exchange student from Shanghai or Mumbai, than someone from rural Pennsylvania, Texas, or South Dakota. There is a circuit of elite places like Ibiza, London, the Hamptons, where people from all over the world congregate, with no knowledge or connection to the countryside of their own countries. For example, a third of Americans live in regions of the country which have an honor culture. However, the concept of honor is completely alien to people in modern culture. It's just a concept they never think about, and when they're told about it, it just weirds them out. A company can move their headquarters from New York to Atlanta and have no idea it's Southern culture or history. A wealthy person in Shenzhen won't be able to speak the local dialect of Cantonese. A person of half Turkish-Polish ancestry living in Germany can spend their whole life never eating German food, 
knowing who Frederick Barbarossa was, and hating the nation of Germany itself. In my opinion, it's unfair to class these people as being parts of the culture of the areas they live in, since they actively reject it and know nothing about it. However, I still want to analyze what their culture is, given even though they would deny that they have a culture, as humans, we all do. In some ways, this makes our elite one of the worst in history. They live in different cities, different cultures, and civilizations than their subjects. They are so elite, they create a completely different civilization or culture. Even the business moguls of the Victorian period, or the nobility of medieval Europe, lived in the same cities and had the same religion or values as their subjects. Due to technology, the current elite is the most isolated they've ever been in history from the rest of the population. They don't even see servants regularly. They're even able to trick themselves that they're not an elite and there is no poverty in their countries. Modernity formed over the course of centuries in the early modern period. The first place you really see it is in the Italian Renaissance, where the humanist thinkers involved put themselves in direct opposition to the medieval Western society that came before. However, the Renaissance was both too classical and too Christian to really split off from Western civilization. The idea for humanism, which is modernity's true religion, is that humanity is wise, strong, and good enough that it can flourish without focusing on God. The ideal starting in the Renaissance was that we should raise the civilization, education, and morality of the public to gradually build the utopia. This created what Thomas Sowell has called the open vision of the world, or that human nature is good and perfectible. All of modernity is founded upon this belief. My test for when modern civilization starts is whether or not it calls itself modern. If you asked a British man in 1900 if he was part of Western civilization, he'd say so without hesitation. He'd say Britain was a great country due to its Anglo-Saxon heritage, Christian religion, its history, culture, and being a part of Western civilization. His identity would be fundamentally Western in every single way. If you asked a British man in 2000 the same question, he'd have reservations. He'd say that Britain was a Western country, but hem and haw, about the West not being perfect and they've changed a lot while denouncing his ancestors. This is an identity built in opposition to his ancestors. People are going to say that modern civilization is an aspect of Western civilization, in that when countries say they modernize or secularize, the implicit assumption is that they would take cultural traditions that come from the West and were invented there, such as science, feminism, and the concept of modernity itself came out of Western civilization. And I think that there is a lot of validity to this viewpoint. However, even though modern civilization started in the West, I think it evolved into its own thing. Oswald Spengler called Western civilization Faustian, or based upon the German myth and story updated by Goethe called Faust, which is a man who sells his soul to the devil for great wealth and knowledge. And what Spengler was saying was that the West was willing to sacrifice its own identity for immense power and to sacrifice its own traditions for technological and social progress. And one of my friends described modern civilization as the Faustian devil the West has done the deal with, and that as the West has traded its identity, it's traded it for modernism and the idea of reaching the modern utopia. And so although modern civilization started in the West, it is fundamentally built off not being the West, and that's why I'm making the distinction here. And as I've said before, these civilization videos and how you choose to divide up civilizations, like whether Latin America is part of Western civilization or whether Japan is part of Chinese civilization is arbitrary. And so I think you could very reasonably say modern civilization is part of Western civilization. However, for this video, I'm not going to do that since I think it's interesting to analyze modern civilization by itself. The Enlightenment, which was based around using rationality to improve society, as opposed to tradition and religion, is very clearly modern. And you could say that the intellectuals moved from a religious to modern worldview in the early 18th century. Something we forget, though, is that the Enlightenment was concentrated among a pretty small group of intellectuals, while the vast majority of people in Western Europe were still very religious and steeped in the previous traditional society. The first time that you see a self-consciously modern civilization is the French Revolution. The Jacobins saw themselves as a completely distinct civilization. 
removing religion, renaming and redesigning the days of the week, changing labor relations and the class structure. They thought they should reconstruct society to make it more rational and progressive. The French Revolution was ultimately crushed and collapsed due to its own problems, but philosophers like John Stuart Mill in the middle of the 19th century are also modern. John Stuart Mill constructed a post-Christian worldview around the principles of progress and reducing harm. These are principles that ultimately come from Christianity as I described in this video, but they evolved into becoming their own religion, and it bounced among philosophers during the 19th century. What I would say is the point where we've unquestionably reached modernity is when Karl Marx was writing in the mid-19th century. This is since Marx's worldview is founded upon the assumptions implicit in a modernist worldview, being completely obvious as he wrote it. That's why Marxism was considered to be rational and scientific, even though Marxists are never willing to submit their theories to the rigor of a scientific test, or even that the underlying assumptions are incorrect and were never tested. These ideas which we see implicitly built into Marxism, which were automatically considered to be obvious by the mid-19th century, were the equality of all people, how progress is natural and something that will inherently happen, that rational thought is superior to tradition or intuition, that scientific planning is the best way to manage society, we were gradually moving towards the direction of peace, unity, and love, or that human nature is perfectible. By the mid-19th century, these assumptions were just taken for granted by educated people across the political spectrum, except for the hard right which launched a reactionary revolt after the world wars through fascism. The way modernity's core assumptions were set in place wasn't through scientific or rational study. The idea that human nature was perfectible, or there were all blank slates, was never scientifically tested. In fact, when we did study these things 10 years ago, as you can see through John Haidt's wonderful work, the opposite was actually true, which corresponded with what the rest of humanity thought, that human nature is by natural form corruptible and has the potential for both good and evil, depending on the context. Instead, the reason these beliefs came to be was that across this whole period was one of profound advancement in Europe. Europeans became more technologically advanced, less violent, more powerful, more productive, and civilized continuously for the 1,000 years up to the 19th century. Thus, it was obvious to these people that progress was just something that would naturally happen. However, what they didn't realize was that this era for Western civilization was the only time this had ever happened in human history. They didn't realize that the norm for literally every other civilization and era of history was stagnation, followed by collapse into dark ages and barbarian conquest. They took for granted what was a bizarre era. Furthermore, they didn't realize that for almost all of this time period, or basically until the Enlightenment, progress was slow enough that it wasn't seen as progress, and it wasn't noticeable over a lifetime. For the medieval and early modern period, Europe's vision of progress was trying to reach God more fully, not technological or sociological. The modernist thinkers foolishly didn't look back on the rest of history that every empire ever over history falls. Modernity developed an idea of specialness and arrogance from it stemming from a period that was the most rapid era of growth ever. Modernity is really ruled by philosophers. If you look at the kinds of thinkers modernists draw their worldview from, it's people like John Stuart Mill, Karl Marx, Popper, John Locke, Bertrand Russell, or Foucault. The gestation period for modernity as I describe it here was the 19th century. Although it reaches back in some forms of the Renaissance, the massive power provided by the Industrial Revolution created the public will for the religion of progress. The 19th century had the air of progress being immutable. Before World War I, there was an idea that rationality, God, and the Enlightenment would guide us to utopia. This is a hybrid between a Western and modern worldview. One of the most fascinating ideas Charles Taylor talks about in his book A Secular Age is the idea that developed over the Enlightenment, that there is this shared scientific or global community. This is an idea that we love to throw around, saying, with the support of the global community. This determines what is right and wrong, and the global community is the shared direction all societies should aim towards in the modernist worldview. However, when you look at a map of the places that are talked about as being the global community, it's just modern civilization. Modern society has this idea of a shared, let's call it boat, of progress that all reasonable people are a part of. 
This global community, not divided by war, ideology, or dissent, progresses together towards utopia. This fantasy is what created the United Nations or European Union. In reality, it's an evolution from the Catholic Church, but secular. Modern civilization rewrote history in its image in the mid-19th century. This is a vision of continuous progress, starting with the Greeks and the Romans until the present. And it's... Democratic equivalent is Whig history, while its leftist version is Marxist dialectical. And in all of this, coming either originally from Hegel or Herbert Spencer, is this idea of progress through evolution. The way this worldview works is that history basically started with the Greeks and the Romans, which modern civilization believed to be our progenitors, being rational, largely secular, having democracy, and what we would believe to be science and philosophy. And so if you read a lot of modern histories, including just textbooks of history that we have in school, which is basically the state-enforced education, or more especially our histories of science, philosophy, education, and democracy, is that we start with the Greeks and the Romans, nothing happened before them, and then we skip across the Middle Ages to the early modern period. In these books, three quarters of the history is after 1500, with often a single chapter for the thousand years between the fall of Rome and the Renaissance. And the thing that these histories will not say is that the Greeks and the Romans didn't practice science, and their vision of the world was completely different from what we have today. They thought that applying rationality to the physical world was ungentlemanly, and classical civilization, as I talk about in this video, was fundamentally a collectivist, slave society, and very aristocratic. What it won't say is that the origins of the modern Western world stem from Christianity and the Middle Ages. Individualism came from a combination of the Germanic and Celtic tribes and the Catholic Church splitting up families. They won't say that Catholic monks invented the scientific method, or that medieval Europe had the invention of the universities, the stock market, and all the tools of modern Western civilization. And medieval Europe was the most advanced society up to its point, barring China at the same time as a possible competitor. And they act as if the entire thousand years was a dark age. And the thing that they won't say is that the early scientists were not agnostics or modernists, they were Christians. Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, Galileo all studied the esoteric. And so it's this cherry picking of history to fit a secular modernist vision of the world. This vision of the world actively ignores what history looks like if you read it in an honest perspective. If you look at each century, you'll find that there are nearly as many decades of decline as they are of progress, that the normal state of history is the rise and fall of empires, ethnicities splitting apart, new religions arising, waning and waxing fanaticism. And if you read history honestly, you realize humanity is a bunch of crazy monkeys who don't really know what they're doing. However, the modernists have cherry-picked a vision of history in which progress occurs and we become infinitely more rational, which creates a myth of the moral arc of history, which is a very simplistic worldview, which is effectively their god that they draw power from, and there is no realization of how messy the actual world is. This worldview also only focuses upon intellectuals in Western Europe and America, which are the kinds of people who are writing this. Talking about events in China or even Eastern Europe, or events that were still important to people at the time, like the War of Spanish Succession or the Thirty Years' War, has very little place in modernist histories. It's a history of what I said before is the global community, which is seen as the only thing that matters in a modernist worldview. It's hard to overestimate how profound the Industrial Revolution felt at the time. It went from a society where almost every task was done with muscle power to one which could literally move mountains. Keep in mind the late 19th century was the period of the most rapid technological advance ever. Not even an easy stuff, that whole time period saw the most breakthroughs across entire disciplines, like biology, chemistry, engineering, agriculture, transportation, military, or public health. Nothing like it has seen 
before, or since. In a single lifetime, you saw the rise of airplanes, cars, electricity, the machine gun, movies, or the refrigerator. Keep in mind, boys who fought at age 18 in the American Civil War lived to see the atom bomb. With human nature being what it is, it's completely reasonable to see that people got carried away. As a person who knows a lot of content creators, this is very similar to someone who goes from being an 18-year-old kid from a small town to a YouTube millionaire. They often become insufferably arrogant, lose a work ethic, any sense of realness, and think they're too special to conform to any standards. In my life, there was a eight-month period where I was losing money on YouTube or treading water. In retrospect, it was good for me since it forced me to improve my video production, a channel's quality in general, and kept me real with the threat of the outside world. However, what happens when that reality check never happens? It did happen for modern civilization, though. That being the World Wars, the trenches of World War I were completely traumatic for Western civilization. The general consensus among everyone was that the world was fated for progress, global unity, unity and peace forever. Only a couple chads like Teddy Roosevelt or Winston Churchill realized that a war was around the corner, and a horrible one at that. However, what happened instead was a barbaric war fought in the most horrifying fashion. All the technologies which brought incredible growths and quality of life also killed millions. The trains brought troops, the nitrogen fertilizer made bombs, Airplanes dropped even more bombs, while the higher social trust led to millions of young men happily dying in the trenches for their countries. In Europe, modern civilization rose to dominance with World War I. Before then, most of the continent was run by aristocracy and monarchs who drew power from divine right. After then, the continent became run by social reformers who drew their right to rule from progress. Fascists took over Spain, Germany, and Japan— Communists took over Russia, and utopian social engineering ideologies took over Britain, France, and America. Before World War I, modernism was one of many gods that the West served. After that, it became the only one. One of the great ironies of the world is that when a society faces an issue, it normally doubles down on its most negative trait rather than changing. When the Aztecs realized their civilization was doomed, they sacrificed more people. When the Nazis realized they were going to lose the war, they killed more Jews. And when Islam or China lost to the West, they became more conservative. Modernity responded to World War I, a war caused by modernization by removing all aspects of pre-modern culture, or as many as it could. Going into World War I, Europe had strong traditional cultures. There were elaborate codes of politeness, obsession with honor, aristocratic dress styles, elevation of folkways, and a deliberate attempt to maintain a culture that reached back to ancient Greece, Rome, or the Middle Ages. After that, everything that was related to the pre-war culture was jettisoned as uncool. The 20s were the start of the world we live in today. Clothing got skimpier, religion got weaker, a majority of the population lived in cities, socialism or democratic socialism and communism got bigger, women got the vote, and about 20 other things. Our current age was formed in the 20s. This wasn't just World War I in that there were so many large social shifts going on at the exact same time that the old culture had to be warped. These included the massive rises in population, mass urbanization, colonialism, and feminization. I think what happened is that the changes implicit to industrialization were so big that it made people think that nothing in their traditional culture was useful. Furthermore, the immense wealth made people resent the old standards that their culture used, as they thought, due to growing wealth, they didn't need to have any social standards at all. Western and European civilization thought that since the war was in the past, like their traditional cultures, that if they left behind their old cultures, they could make an idealistic jump to a new modern culture, and collectively, as a civilization, leave behind all the negatives of the past. The logic of the class was to form a monopoly monopoly on violence, in that which since the West controlled the whole world at that point, that they could form a gentleman's agreement that certain things were bad and enforce it upon the rest of the planet. That if the West could agree to it, we could build a utopia. This is the origin of what I call Greta Thunberg logic. In 1920, or even 1970, if you got the Western and broader European world to agree on something, it would happen. This is the story of the ideals of modern social justice, of why they enforce social change on just the Western world. What the Greta Thunbergs of the world don't realize now is that if the West stops producing emissions, India and China still will, and they already make up the bulk of emissions today. Furthermore, that if you deindustrialize the West, you'll destroy technological progress that could help deal with climate change later. Modernity creates cultural solipsism of thinking all outside of your 
your modern world are irrelevant, backwards, or stupid. Ironically, the left who in abstract are the most caring of other cultures, in their actual worldview treat non-Western areas as if they're completely irrelevant and have no agency. This idea was proved to be completely wrong with the world wars. The thing is that it even hurt its own movement, in that the pacifist streak in France or Britain, for example, weakened them against Nazi Germany, which then resulted in the Germans conquering all of Western Europe. Pacifism gives all the cards in the negotiation to the worst players, which creates an incentive to defect against pacifists into arm. Modernists can't realize this given they think progress is assured. Progress is almost a god who can never be wrong. With World War II, which showcased even more horror than the First World War, it resulted in modernism's complete rise to total dominance. The reason for this is due to the mass coordination which the nations in the World Wars had. It gave the government enormous power. Every major country in the world, including America, left the World Wars with governments that would be to the left of Norway or the Netherlands today economically. The tax rate in America in 1950 was 90% and 95% in Britain for top incomes. The governments created mass managerial states to needle their way into every aspect of life. This was obviously even more true in communist or fascist nations. Every major civilization has a ruling class which rises to dominance. It was the bureaucrats in China, the priests in India or ancient Egypt, or the slave owners in Greco-Roman civilization. In modern civilization is the managerial class, which was true in the Soviet Soviet fascist and capitalist worlds. In that, society went from rule by business moguls and the nobility to the college educated. We went to a society where your results on a test created your position in government, business, or any field. This changed the entire developed world into like China, run by bureaucrats. An interesting point the conservative writer Samuel Francis has made is that for the first time in history, a majority of the world's population operated in cities and in large organizations like factories or militaries where it was physically impossible to know everyone. And so you had to develop impersonal criteria, which then created a system based off test taking as a easy way to determine personal quality. The problem with this system is that any skills which can't be measured on a test, such as courage, wisdom, and morality, Morality, get left out of elite selection. This then creates a society which is foolish, immoral, and cowardly. The Europeans lost their colonial empires, everything needed to form, you couldn't go whitewater rafting in the local river anymore. Over time, it came to be that the religion of the managers, whether communism, fascism, or liberalism, was enforced in every level of society. Today, every movie must carry its message, and any company that doesn't hire their priests or equity employees opens itself up to a lawsuit or social pariah status. We don't often think about this today, but our societies are not true capitalism in the form of the 19th century or earlier eras of Western history. In almost every European country, the government makes up half or a majority of the entire economy. In America, known for being one of the more capitalist countries in the world, the government makes up half of the economy. In a society like this, government policy is the main driving force of the entire economy. After World War II, you saw modernity cement itself as the one true religion. The idea of progress became universal, or the idea that our era had nothing to learn from previous eras was taken for granted. Science began the way to manage society, in that the society had to change to what the scientific experts said. The nation became pushed along by the whims of what kind of progress the experts demanded next. Our myths and stories we told our children stopped being on ancient gods or medieval heroes, rather nuclear war, radiation, or space travel. A great marker of this is that the entire body of modern literature and film is about a rebellion against the machine, or a depersonalizing modern force. This is the Lord of the Rings, Matrix, Star Wars, Princess Mononoke, Harry Potter, 1984, Fight Club, Terminator, and 2001 A Space Odyssey. The collective subconscious knows what's going on. The atom bomb was a major force in creating a worldview for modern civilization. A point the Twitter influencer Alaric the Visigoth said is that it resulted in us deifying the state and bureaucracy, which now through nuclear weapons hold the power of gods. We view them as all powerful forces that should be worshipped, as in follow the science. Also, that they are completely capable of changing the world and solving all of society's issues, bringing us to a utopia. These are things that previous societies would only deem gods capable of. The atom bomb also created a horrifying fear against violence, especially after the horrors of the world wars. This makes sense, given we very nearly had all of modern civilization wiped out multiple times over the Cold War. I try to be grateful as much as I can that 
I was born because we didn't have a nuclear war. This created a belief that heroism, glory, history, and adventure were just too scary. It's much easier to hide under the longhouse with the managers or new priest class to tell us what to do. A myth had formed the end of history was at hand. This played well into the managerial class, whose role was to tend this utopia, letting the sheep eat peacefully while they harvested their wool. If this was a utopia and no new ideas could develop, wasn't that great for the ruling class? I'd like to focus on the concept that if you ask someone from modern civilization what their culture is, they'll say they don't have any culture. Leftists in America like to say white people don't have any culture. That's insane. What do you call George Washington, Beethoven, the hamburger, English common law, and Hollywood movies? Culture is how a society operates. It has to exist. What this belief belies is that modern people really believe how they act is the scientifically best way to act, and everyone else's culture culture is just irrational superstition. If you ask someone who's a modernist why equality is good, they'll just look at you completely dumbfounded. Of course equality is good, and you're a bad person for asking. The way most societies in history would explain this is, I believe equality is good since Christ told us. We are better since we follow Christ, and here's a book to explain why. We are the people who we are because we follow Christ. What that does, at least, is identify that you are different from other people for that belief and where that belief comes from. It creates a sense of self-awareness and identity that your argument comes from somewhere and is founded upon certain principles. Modernity doesn't do that, and it's the only people who don't do that. Modernity has this religious concept of faith inside of it that its exponents will believe to the death, but none really think about. This is the idea that they're completely different from everyone else, and this is self-evidently true. I notice this since it's most self-evident since it percolates into my chosen field of history. Our society treats history with no respect. It's taboo to use history as a discipline if you'd like to learn lessons from it. If you bring up the idea of using history to understand the world in academia, you'll be a immediately outcasted and your reputation will be destroyed. However, if you apply this same logic to different academic fields, it's absolutely insane. For science, we base our worldview off previous empirical evidence from the actual world. If you said all the evidence for tide patterns were useless given the world has changed so much, you'd be laughed at. However, you're looking at through history, what the real evidence of what you know has actually happened. If you don't use history to understand the world, you're just making stuff up. However, the idea that the lessons of history don't apply to us anymore is so self-evident that you can't even question it. I haven't seen a coherent argument for why the lessons of history aren't useful anymore from anyone. The problem is that every era of history views itself as special, and they're all wrong. Everyone thinks their civilization or empire will last forever, and they're all, again, wrong. If this has been tested dozens of times all over the world for thousands of years, and it's always wrong, to believe otherwise is literal madness. Apocryphally, the definition of madness is when you try the same thing again and again while expecting different results. To continue with the idea of madness, the underlying nature of modernity is to reject any evidence or stuff that would tether us to the earth. When modern societies want to improve, they destroy social institutions from the previous society. Modernity prides itself on killing the family, traditional ethnicity, religion, class structure, folk economies, gender relations, and everything else that makes a society that society. Modernity very firmly believes in a concept Charles Taylor from his book The Secular Age calls the buffered personality. What that means is they remove people or things from the context they exist in. The way the modern world views the individual as a distinct distinct little chess piece. This chess piece acts rationally and is split off from all the other pieces. By isolating this piece and improving it as an individual, the whole chessboard will improve. By removing constraints on this single chess piece, we can finally empower it to do what it wants. The problem here is that this isn't how the world works. We really exist in ecosystems. Your worldview isn't rational. It's influenced by your genetics, culture, community, upbringing, social class, and more. By removing shared things and tethers, you're just destroying that person. If you take a person and remove them from their work, hometown, burn down the forest they played in as a kid, and take away their wife, they won't be empowered. They're more likely to kill themselves. Modern therapy is a great example of this, in that the only way our society can contextualize how to deal with mental health 
is through therapy. This is since it's a way for a person to rationally change their mind on an individual basis. However, we've found religion and community are really the factors that affect happiness the most. We didn't reach this conclusion since we put mental health in a psychiatry bracket, splitting it apart from religion and community, so we never mix them together. Modernity cannot think holistically. I'm not saying modernity is individualistic like the West is. A better way to view it is that there are very collectivist modern society, such as fascism, communism, or modern leftism, but they view the individual as a discrete pawn independent from their social context. I was having an interesting conversation with a friend where I was telling her about why deindustrialization was such a profound part of how I form my political worldview, because I grew up in Pennsylvania and the Rust Belt was something that was very plain to see around me. And what happened was that the elites who shipped our factories, which supported my entire area, over to Mexico or China, said that they would do other things to make sure that it didn't destroy the area. But that was a complete lie. And now Philadelphia has less people than it did in 1950. And what she said was that the elites, and she's from Washington, D.C., viewed this as we were pawns in the push for greater progress. And that we should console ourselves for losing our area's livelihood, that we helped progress happen, and that it was greedy for us to not want to support progress. And I said, that's so self-evidently self-interested that it just comes across as ridiculous. And I said that the elite effectively treats people like livestock or a herd they can move around for the benefit of the greater farm and not treating the people that they rule as if they're agents in independent people with souls. Whenever modern people try to improve something, we isolate it, put a lot of pressure into it, and then don't realize there will be consequences. Communism is the easiest example. With it had the idea to destroy everything that held the societies down, like the family, school system, officer class, church, doctors, ethnic minorities, yeoman farmers, and aristocracy. This ended up destroying communist societies. Communists view society as a machine where they should cut out gears, but it's really an ecosystem. Where I grew up, we had way too many deer because the hunters had shot the wolves, not thinking about the consequences or caring. The deer started to balloon their numbers, and then there was a deer plague in which they would die, and the deer killed all of the foliage in the forest because there were just too many of them. We don't think in terms of human societies being ecosystems, but if you remove one thing from an ecosystem, the entire ecosystem is going to fall apart. Modernity defines itself only by what it is not, not what it is. This is why the person will say they don't have any culture. This is because they've consciously tried to remove any culture and ties to the past or reality. This is since the ties to the past hold them down. They have reached a rational new state in which they don't need any of those old barriers. The problem here is that if you destroy everything that makes up your society, you have nothing to live for. In hard times, you lean on your wife, your friends, God, or you keep pushing in a tough war to save your nation. Once you remove all of these, you get staggering listlessness and loneliness. This is the problem modernity faces. The more it succeeds, the more it pushes itself into depression. Modernity has nothing to stand for, which is why our society is so relentlessly negative and nihilistic. And it's also why all modernist philosophers struggle with the problem of meaning and loneliness, which would be completely incomprehensible to people in the pre-modern world. This is why we have the worst mental health in history today. It's partly why our birth rate is collapsing, why no young people in the West are willing to die for their nations. No one likes modernity. Modernity is a fire which burns previous cultural institutions without adding anything. Think of it this way. We really haven't developed any new ideas since the French Revolution. The early 1800s developed socialism, feminism, hedonism, technologism, and industrialization. No one in our society is proud to be the establishment or lead the society. In America, every single faction says that they are fighting the establishment. If you look at modernist ideologies, communists or fascists also say they're fighting the establishment. Isn't it ironic that the wealthiest, safest, and healthiest society in history is so loathed by its inhabitants. Our entire society could be called Rage Against the Machine, like the band, where all of those political groups that I mentioned before say they're fighting the establishment even if they are the establishment. And I said before, all of our stories are fighting a depersonalized monster or machine, and everyone knows in their hearts that the depersonalization brought by industrialization is not good. And so they create a mask of fighting against 
against it because we all intuitively know that the center of our civilization is this machine that basically just wants more output. However, when people actually get into power, they give the machine more power because that's what gives them more power. We are the only era ever in history which believes it has nothing to learn from any other eras. All other times of history viewed the past with respect. They had religions to guide them with a spirit world, they had gender roles, social classes, the idea of a nation. These things were viewed as self-evidently the way of the world. People read history and saw examples of people questioning this, and it massively backfired. What modernity said was that it was totally special, none of the principles that had taken thousands of years to develop and had been tested continuously, and in fact, everyone else in history was an idiot. If you're the only person who's right and everyone else is completely wrong, you're crazy. Modernity fits the literal definition of insanity. One of my friends liked to say that the people who had the closest worldview to modernity from history were religious fanatics. Almost all societies in history viewed history and the world as the record of the rise and fall of empires and societies. That this would not end soon and you had to be responsible since if you weren't, your society would fall apart and get conquered. You had a responsibility to your descendants to pass on the society you inherited to your children in the same manner your ancestors passed it on to you. Modern society is very teenage in that it thinks if only we pushed a little bit further, we could reach utopia. Anyone who doesn't see that is stupid or immoral. For the rest of history, most people would see this as insane. When societies get too safe and wealthy, they fall to decadence or get conquered by barbarians and fall into degeneracy. This is what has happened to every society ever. However, the idea modern people have that they are on the verge of utopia that will change everything is something religious fanatics have believes it's the dawn of time, except their utopia is spiritual, not material. Everyone who doesn't trust their god is either stupid or evil. Our era is run by religious fanatics who worship the god of progress. There are three skeleton keys or underlying concepts which explain almost everything in modernity. One of the ironic things about this video is I've pulled from lots of authors from the exact opposite side of the political spectrum. This is since the people who criticize modernity tend to be radicals who are disaffected with it. That doesn't mean they're wrong, though. The truth is complicated and multifaceted, so the anarchist, fascist, libertarian, and monarchist authors I'm pulling from here who criticize modernity, and if those people can agree on things, it means it's probably true. The first skeleton key in author is James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State. This is a book which says that the main point of modernity is to construct society according to the principles of what looks good on a spreadsheet. The example he gives is Brasilia, the artificial capital of Brazil, which was designed to be aesthetically beautiful from a spreadsheet, but turned into a completely unlivable place. Another example is American suburbia, in which giant areas are zoned purely for housing and others for commercial. I grew up an hour outside Philly, which isn't that far, all things considered, but in all the places I lived, the nearest grocery store was 20 minutes away. All social engineering operates like this. Nazism and communism are great examples of how social planning, based on ideological principles, massively backfires in practice. A great example of this is American civil rights law, of which Richard Hanania has a brilliant book about. What started out as an attempt to avoid discrimination in the post-Jim Crow South turned into an entire culture obsessed with racial oppression as companies had to keep racial quotas for hiring and have large diversity priest departments to avoid lawsuits. I have a text wall here to explain the whole theory. You know how in science fiction there are AIs which start with a single principle, such as don't hurt humans, and then as the code keeps operating for longer than the creator intended, off that logic you get to some insane conclusion like vacuuming the oceans to prevent drowning deaths. Modernity operates like this. We have no context in the spiral into complete insanity, which is what I would call Stalinism, wokeness, or Nazism. You start with a principle like, let's not hurt kids, and then that warps into helicopter parenting, which raises a generation of fragile and dysfunctional people. Let's not be mean to black people, turned into the West trying to commit civilizational suicide. This leads to the next book. The Master and His Emissary by Ian McGillchrist. This book talks about the right and left hemispheres of the brain, which is a controversial theory, but here's a text wall to talk about this. The left brain, when tested, can only see half of reality. For example, when you act to make a drawing, can only draw half of a tree or a house. The left hemisphere can only see the world through logical structures it constructs and understands. It sees the world as basically a flowchart of interconnected logic. It believes these things with complete certainty and assumes it's completely accurate. The 
The left hemisphere is completely incapable of seeing things flow over time, context, emergent phenomena, or things you can't measure autistically, like beauty, art, love, or emotions. It has no concept of morals, or at least not incredibly rigid ones. The right hemisphere does all of those things. In speech, for example, the left hemisphere forms the sentence construction while the right does the intonation, meaning, poetry, and style. The right hemisphere is capable of forming the correct answer when tested, but is humble and realizes that it's not always right, and the truth is always incomplete. The left hemisphere will often outshout the right due to being more confident, even though it's incorrect. When people have right hemispheres knocked out, they often become sociopaths who lose any sense of social grace, but who can still do mathematical and mechanical tasks. People whose left hemispheres are knocked out have trouble doing things, but feel a profound sense of inner peace and satisfaction. One of the things I dislike the most about modern thinking comes from the left hemisphere, and that's the inability to see the world outside of binary yes or no answers. The reality is the world's very complicated and subtle, and everything operates according to gradation. People often like to talk about political absolutes, like what is the best political system, and although I do like democracy, I don't think democracy will work for every society in the world and history. And whenever people ask me for advice, whether personal, business, or romantic, I ask two things. The first is, I need to know what you're good at and what you like to do because that's what creates a competitive advantage for you. And secondly, I need to know the context because the context determines absolutely everything in how you act. And modernity doesn't like to think in this much subtlety, but once you remove the subtlety, you remove the entire human experience. The left hemisphere gained complete dominance over the last 200 years due to industrialization, in which machinery is the most perfectly left hemisphere thing. And as machinery got more important, we built our society as if it was a machine and tried to treat everything as a machine. We talk about humans like they're machines. We talk about the ecosystem like it's a machine. One of the questions I love to ask people is what evidence would you need to see to change your mind on a subject? This is a test to see how rational someone is. If their worldview is built built upon falsification or the scientific method, or if they are willing to change their minds at all. The depressing thing is that most people don't get the question at all. They're either so emotional that they're so certain they're right that they can't be proven wrong, or they're so autistic they've built an entire logical structure around their worldview that you can't disprove. If there's one logical out, an autistic person will take it, and thus their entire logical structure is true by definition. What the left hemisphere does is build a logical structure or measurement and then confuse it for reality. IQ becomes intelligence itself. GDP per capita becomes the economy. Material comfort equals happiness. The reality is the world is much more complicated than this. One of my favorite lines from all of history is the Zen Buddhist saying, do not confuse the finger pointing at the moon for the moon itself. Now we pretend the moon doesn't exist at all. We do this all the time. Communists confuse their theory of history for actual history. In a communist worldview, they can't be proven wrong by definition, and anyone who disagrees is a class enemy. In a Freudian worldview, anyone who disagrees is repressed. Postmodernism used its argument that you can't prove anything to say that the world doesn't exist. However, this doesn't change the fact that the world does exist. Modernity's great sin is confusing the definition of something for the thing itself. Postmodernism literally says that since we can define the terms for reality and how we explain it, we control reality since we can use the definition to make reality. This is an argument that ultimately means humans can control reality. The problem the problem is that once humans believe they control reality, they aren't accountable to anything and go insane. In personal life, only crazy people think they're a god capable of controlling everything. However, it's an opinion a majority of the population holds in our society, or that humans can accomplish anything we set our minds to. If there's any disparity between races, it must be caused by racism, since the human social structure controls everything. If we want to say completely eradicate poverty, it doesn't take into account the massive thousands of year old reasons why poverty exists. We believe that we control reality and every failing in the world stems from humanity. However, we have to accept that reality is real. A lot of people, if you ask them to accept reality, will say that we can just make a better world and change that reality. The modern world has gotten resentful when the actual reality does not fit into its arbitrary logical system. This then results in it trying to destroy reality itself rather than adjusting its theory. This is the origin of totalitarianism. The final theory is something that it might take a second for you guys to adjust to, but let me talk for a couple minutes and I'll make sense by the end. The entire modern world has been following an ancient religion without even realizing 
criticizing it. That being Gnosticism. Gnosticism was a religion from the ancient Middle East which developed forms that latched onto Judaism, Christianity, and other religions. Once you compare the philosophic assumptions of Gnosticism to modernity, you realize they're basically the exact same. Gnosticism believed that the world was an evil conspiracy by an evil god who wanted people to suffer. They held that there is a hidden truth that once you accept it, you can break out of this evil world. The fruit of knowledge given by Satan in the Garden of Eden was a good decision since it gave mankind the fruit of knowledge. This truth is that man is a god by nature, capable of controlling reality. The more you accept this, the more capable you are of rising to the perfect spiritual range of existence, away from the earth run by the crooked god. What Gnosticism basically does is swap the devil and God for each other's position in Christianity. What are some similarities in Gnosticism and the modern worldview? First of all, that the old order was oppressive evil and we have nothing to learn or compare ourselves to it. That by accepting the hidden truth of our immense power, we are capable of attaining perfection. Once everyone takes this shared truth, we can live in a utopia. Those who don't adopt it are stuck in the old evil world due to either being stupid or evil. Finally, the Gnostics believe that by defining terms, you are capable of controlling reality. The Gnostics invented the idea of creating an image and definition for the world with an underlying theory and then confusing those theories and definitions for the reality. These are all things that you only see shared between the Gnostics and the modern world. Every other religion says that you need to accept the flawed nature of ourselves, and from that, you can improve. This also explains modernity's conception that is so incomparable to any other era and why it's so self-evidently superior, or its inability to comprehend why anyone would disagree with it, also why they don't have to explain themselves to anyone. Gnostics said that they had the nous, or the hidden truth which is self-evident once you discover it, and those who do not accept it are just not part of the anointed. How do you get from being an ancient religion to the secret one of the modern world? The answer is that Gnosticism survived under the surface for millennia in secret philosophic associations. We have lots of proof for this, and keep in mind this was a very religious society, where all educated people thought about religion. The heretics the Catholic Church were fighting like the Catholic were Gnostics, and alchemy had a big Gnostic element to it. The kinds of people who are on the outcasts of the church, or the educated humanists, were the sort of people who were also studying Gnosticism. We forget this at the time, but all the founders of science, like Isaac Newton, Galileo, or Francis Bacon, were all steeped in religious lore and the esoteric. Hegel used a lot of Gnostic terminology and has a very Gnostic worldview. This is something we've written out of the histories, but the 19th century was a big period of fascination with the occult. I have a bunch of books which show how the revolutionary and modernist thinkers were people who were also very steeped in the occult. We have records of Karl Marx himself talking about dreams of being given a great gift by Satan. He was a Satanist and hated God. Look this stuff up. I'm not making it up. Saul Linsky, the biggest leftist American organizer of the 20th century, literally dedicated his book to Satan. Hitler talked about how he felt he was pushed along by a great destiny and spiritual force, which was irrespective of the Christian God. Imagine if the Gnostics were to win, what it would look like. Gnosticism was always a secret religion, in that there was no separate Gnostic church, but there would be Gnostic sects of other religions, such as Judaism, Christianity, or the previous religions. So it would make sense that the Gnostics would push a Gnostic Gnostic worldview through other ideologies like liberalism, Marxism, or fascism, and not say they're Gnostic. And then as they grow, they treat their worldview as self-evidently true and don't explain it because that's how they view it. And so it makes sense the Gnostics would never be open about their worldview because they never were. Again, I know this sounds like a conspiracy theory, but this is the sort of thing where we have an extensive paper trail and respected historians have backed this up. This leads to a very uncomfortable point, and our society actively tells us to not think in this manner. Although I am religious, for agnostics and atheists in the audience, please give me 30 seconds to explain this in non-religious terms. If you factor in Satan as being the negative aspects of human nature, and religion as social evolutions for traditions that hold society together, this theory also makes sense.
What happened in modernity was with all the mass advancement at incredibly rapid speed, thus, first of all, that removed incentives towards traditional values which held society together in hard times, such as chastity, courage, loyalty, patriotism, and other things. Once you're in a wealthy society which no longer needs these to survive, decadence, which is a normal historic process, sinks in. As people realize subconsciously their decadence is wrong, they lash out at their traditional values and social structure out of resentment. They build society in opposition to them to assuage their guilt. This is why our society glorifies hedonism and hates virtue today. Secondly, with all this massive new power, it looked to humanity as if they had made a breakthrough where we no longer needed God. For the new ruling class of the managers, religion was something which held them back. Religion told them they weren't perfectible, that they shouldn't nakedly desire power. But the idea that there were constraints on our power driven by human nature would hold them back. Thus, the old Gnostic ideal that humanity was capable of being a god looked attractive. Even if this doesn't descend from Gnosticism, it's a logical conclusion based off the self-interest of the elite at the time that could have formed organically independently. If the elite could destroy religion and tradition, they could seize total control of the society. This is why modern society hates good art and why its architecture looks like this. If the population is beauty, god, or communities, it would create reasons for them to not support the ruling class. If the art and architecture of a society demonstrates their soul and inner character, then our art and architecture shows that we have no soul. We have no idea what we're doing or what we stand for. This is the reason for gender fluidity. By breaking apart the most fundamental part of our nature, the split between men and women which allows us to procreate, the ruling class is able to get the population to believe whatever they want, no matter how absurd, to demonstrate their complete mental dominance over you. Our society hates all the things the older society respected, such as the patriarchy, beauty, law, order, the family, strong values, children, and ethnicity. You can say that these things were bad, and they definitely had some negatives, but these were all the things that all society could agree were good beforehand without even questioning it. Ironically, this is pushed by the ruling class, which is insane, since you would think they'd want to keep stabilizers, which you'd think would make their power more secure. Instead, they want to destroy them since they resent human nature. They resent anything that holds it together. They delude themselves with fantasies of utopia as they happily burn their societies down. The reason the elite puts up Satanist statues, has Satanist costumes or movies where evil is good, is since they hate all responsibility in order. That would create standards they'd be held against. They like Satan since his message of complete openness, hedonism, no standards, and mental closed-mindedness is what they want for themselves. That's why someone who doesn't believe the outside world is real would want, as they can't envision, them failing since they control reality. Also, a population which has been inculcated with these values will have already willingly turned themselves into slaves through removing any responsibility or personal growth which would allow independence. Again, for non-religious people in this audience, you can view these as symbolic for the chaotic and stabilizing elements of the human condition, and our elite supports chaos. And the problem here is that a system driven off rebelling against the natural order can't survive since it can't create any stability. All the modernist ideologies have failed or are in the process of failing. Modernity pushes for idiotic things since it treats progress or change as a good in of itself. When it gets stressed, it pushes even harder without taking time to slow down and analyze. This is why woke people are pushing so hard to change society immediately now. Why the Axis attempted to conquer the world in a couple years, or the communist five-year plans to industrialize their societies. At the end of each of these was supposedly a utopia, but instead it was the ruin of their entire society. Modernity is incapable of introspection since it would have to then think about what it's doing. It would feel the gnawing emptiness inside of it and realize how flawed its underlying premises are. To loop back to the beginning of the video, the term postmodern developed after World War II as a reaction to the horrors of the World Wars and the looming threat of nuclear Armageddon, combined with the immense wealth of the post-war period, and it made the people involved realize Modernity's not making us happy, and something clearly went wrong, which then created an ennui with modernism, thus leading to postmodernism. The point, though, is postmodernism is still in relation to modern, meaning it doesn't really have a new idea.
When modernist ruling regimes face stress, they push harder for progress because their power comes from delivering progress. And when that doesn't happen, they have to either crack down on their populations in an authoritarian manner or appear as if they are pushing for progress really hard, working their populations to death so the populations don't have the energy to realize that they were tricked. Civilizations are always driven by two ideological spirits, one of which is masculine and the other is feminine. Examples of this are Confucianism and Taoism in China, the farmer versus herder cultures in Islam, or the barbarian versus Christian elements to Western civilization, or the Apollonian and Dionysian sides of classical civilization. For modernity, this is the duality of the autistic masculine versus the hysterical feminine. This is true in liberal, fascist, and communist societies. We are only able to view the world through autistic mental categories or flowcharts. At the same time, we carry out all of our schemes with a hysterical feminine bent, which you're not allowed to show any dissent. Everyone has to be worked to a frenzy for progress, and if they're not, they're not good people. This creates a really weak and poorly coordinated society. Modernity is doomed by its very structure. The best things happen when you're not trying to force them. Love is like this, where if you try too hard to seduce a girl, she'll sense your desperation. You don't try to develop a brilliant intellectual breakthrough. They come when you relax your mind and do what you love. You work out the most or read the most when you enjoy exercising or reading. When you force yourself to do these things, you burn out. Modernity feels the need to push as hard as possible, and if they're not doing it, they feel guilty. They have no sense of balance or natural timing. Thus, they push too hard, burn out, and fail. All of this, again, means modernity is doomed. The problem is that the underlying principle upon which modernity is based, or the technological project, is doomed. We reached a material utopia in the second half of the 20th century of immense wealth, comfort, no major diseases or wars, no real poverty in the Western world, or material conditions that our ancestors could only dream of. It made us depressed. This proves that the world is not purely material. Through the process, we removed art, religion, family, culture, beauty, the nation, history, and everything else except material comfort. To fit into the modern world, you must believe that everything except hedonism and material comfort is to be completely ignored, or in reality hated. That's not healthy. This left a suicidally depressed population population, which is why the West is killing itself now. Modernity is spoiled rich kid syndrome, in which it takes credit for things that it did not develop. If you look at societies after they pick a modernist ideology, they go into decline in every form in the long term over a period of generations, whether intellectual, cultural, scientific, economic. Tsarist Russia was an economic, military, technological, cultural powerhouse, and the Soviets took power and said, Seven years later, it was a shell of a country. Europe, after it promoted social engineering ideologies, went from the most important place in the world in every single way to none of that. The reason America was the most economically, technologically, culturally, military, politically developed country in large part was that it kept more of its previous value system with things like religion and freedom without modernism burning it out. A century after society loses its religion, it's incapable of having an empire, technological progress progress, or a strong functioning society. This is a trend you saw across France, Britain, Soviet Russia, China, and many other societies. Modernity claims technological progress and infinite gain, but the reality is that it promotes slowdown and crash due to burnout. As modernity failed, its proponents tried to socialize the population more to avoid its collapse. The Unabomber was right that industrial civilization demands over-socialization. For the modern person, they have to be a cog in the machine. They deal with strangers all day and they're not allowed to express their real emotions at work. Hating people is frowned upon. Having violent thoughts is frowned upon, as a man to show sexual interest, being religious, hunting traditional gender roles, wanting to have kids, and everything that makes us human is frowned upon. They desperately try to turn us into robots so we don't have to think about how the society makes no sense, and there's nothing worth living for in the modern world. Wokeness and the World Economic Forum types, and even Xi Jinping in China, are trying to crack down on the population, socialize them, make them eat bugs, not have cars, be poorer, be taught propaganda since the cradle, as the 
the elite realizes how precarious their power is subconsciously. This is why countries are championing degrowth, to make the population weaker and smaller so it's easier to control. The problem here is that due to the collapse in birth rate, which will halve the world's population over the next century, combined with the social collapses we're seeing around the world, the sky-high inequality, mental health issues, and more, is that a crisis is coming and the elites can't control it. Unless they can genetically engineer the population to be cattle, modernity can't survive and will be going into decline for the rest of our lives. I think rather than right versus left being the big divide of the last 200 years, for the next 200 years, I think it will be religion versus materialistic worldview. My generation will end up living in a world of loneliness, population collapse, ennui, collapse of meaning, declining economies, repressive states, and other things that will make progress look like a cruel joke. Technologies like AI or genetic engineering will scare people at the very least and may cause incredible harm. In this world, we will see a war between modernity and the previous civilization civilizations, who will have to update their worldviews of the 21st century. Religion, which is the force which creates communities, art, increases the birth rate and meaning, will make a comeback. This is also assured with the large scientific discoveries around religion, which I'm making future videos about, and there's a text wall here. <sighs> well, you know, there's an old Chinese curse that goes, may you live in interesting times. The reality is we've been cursed but we can be cursed together.